Okay, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream, where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host, Bobby Chu, and I also have on here my old friend, Matt Johnson. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday, everybody. Good to see you. Right on. Uh, super happy to be connecting with Matt again. And today, it's a little, you know, it's pretty much the same kind of format with a little twist with a little bonus because today I'm going to be talking about uh, what makes your art memorable and kind of give you the tips and the things that I've learned over my 20 plus years in the industry as a professional artist and and uh, as well this is going to be um, it's going to be totally interactive as well so if you go to uh, slido.com and you use the hashtag chewstream1 you'll get into the questions uh, that will be coming in from the audience and the audience gets to vote on which questions they would like to get answered first so that makes it super easy for us and uh, hopefully it'll be super simple for you guys as well now the topic for today is something that, of course, is super important to everybody, um, but especially for the people that don't live in the hub of where everything is going on and what they kind of want to do with their lives. Um, you know, if they live in Sri Lanka and they want to work on Hollywood movies, this becomes especially important for you because you can't just talk to people and you know have people love your stuff and blah 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 and and give you all these awesome jobs you have to actually uh, get them to remember just your art how hard is that mm. especially with all the art that's out there in the world so i wanted to kind of do a little something for you guys which is what makes a good idea Oops, not that. There we go. What <laughs> makes a good idea? Um, and kind of talk about it a little bit because this has been something that I have been engulfed in ever since I started uh, the studio and everything. As many of you know, the people that have really followed me throughout my career, it started online, right? And for people to remember your art, not just you as a person and all this stuff they they have no way of knowing you as a person so they have to really notice your art so let's start off what makes a good idea i'm going to show you a bunch of images okay i'm going to show the audience i'm going to show matt a bunch of images some were successful some were not as successful in terms of memorability in terms of virality online uh, in terms of selling art as prints and things okay so mm. here's the first one the first one is and of course matt you're doing this with me completely live yeah absolutely so, I haven't seen any of these yeah and you probably can't even see them right now so maybe i ah. can um let me do yeah this let me pull this away and uh i'm gonna put that thing back up there and for you, Matt, I will, um, I'll try to do a separate little screen here. Ooh, special preview. I like it. Actually, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but I'm going to try. Um, it's not really. That was me, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Flew by real quick. Okay. Well, hmm. How will I do this for Matt? I don't know. You know, I think that um, it's especially interesting to talk about this now when when you started coming okay. up on the internet, you could, you were one of the first ones to really pioneer a lot of the stuff you were doing. And now, you know, it's it's a much more competitive world on the internet. So I think it's, you know, now more than ever is a good time to learn a little bit about standing out. Definitely. Do you see the image, Matt? I do. Yeah, I do see that. Okay, cool. So here's the first one. 
was this viral or was it not viral for the people that mm. will be listening to this from a podcast later on? They don't have a visual. It's mm-hmm. a little baby uh, alien from the franchise, Aliens. This was a warm-up painting that I did um, just to kick it off. And sometimes warm-ups get a little longer than others, depending on how much I like them. This one, I definitely like it because I was thinking, what if the baby alien from Aliens was actually cute? Right? And mm-hmm. that, that was the premise <laughs> for this painting. So I did it. Was it viral? Was it popular in terms of you know popularity for me, not like Kim Kardashian or something? What do you think, Matt? I have to say yes. I think that this was popular because you took two contrasting ideas, the scary, scary uh, alien and the adorable idea that you went with. Like mashing those two things up, I think it had to be a success. Or was this a flop? No, it was was a relative success. Oops, I can't really touch anything when I'm doing this. Okay, so uh, yeah, it was very much a success because... It was part of an existing franchise. Mm. You know, when you... Everybody knows this as well. When you think about it, fan art, of course, that's going to make things more memorable or more popular to an extent, right? If everything is just a straight copy and you don't put your own twist on it, it will be a lot less memorable than if you did put your own twist on it. That makes perfect sense. But as well... um, it has an emotional impact behind there, and that's something that I will be coming back to over and over again, is the emotional impact, right? Uh, your favorite movie, your favorite book, your favorite anything, just about everything that is your favorite, it is your favorite because it had some sort of emotional impact on you where it really made you feel something, mm. right? If something looks amazing but doesn't make you feel anything it will not be popular it will not be your favorite yeah i know i can look through a library of art on deviant art or anywhere and you you just flip through and you flip through and then all of a sudden you're like oh man look at that one look at that one and you don't even know why right away well sometimes it's just awe-inspiring that's an emotion as well and when something is so awesome it's awe-inspiring. Let's go to the next one here. The next one is done by the wonderful, <laughs> the amazing Kea Sidera. Uh, mm. So she painted this, and was it popular as a print? For sure as popular as a print. Where did people put this in their homes? If you can look at a painting and you can absolutely know, most likely people would put it in this place in their homes, then you got something really going on as well. Because, you know, if you're making art to sell art as something like Mm -hmm. a print, uh, this becomes hugely important, right? So where would it go in a person's home? In the bathroom, Mm. probably. They probably have a child, right? Yep. Or it's in uh, the child's room, perhaps. But most likely, the bathroom, the washroom, uh, that's where you would put it. Now, also, where... Where was it the most popular? That one's an easy one, mm. right? You can just guess, Matt. I'm sure mm-hmm. you would guess it right. Which city oh, yeah. would it be the Definitely. most popular? San Francisco. There you go. Why? Because mm-hmm. it has the bridge in there. And people yeah. look at it and they go, that talks about me. It talks about my life. I want that painting. Right? And mm-hmm. that's another big reason why this became very popular. And, of course... Uh, it has that emotional impact. And what is that emotional impact? It's, it's that, aww, kind of <laughs> feeling, right? Yeah. And it's cute. It's a special, sweet little moment. Just destroying a boat. There you go. <laughs> it's cute. And it has and the funny. humor. Now, yeah. this one is also done by Chaos Dera. It's, um, it's not rendered like crazy, right? This one is an ink drawing with a little splash of blue in there. It's called Blue Tongue Battle. It's this big uh, di- uh, dragon that's sticking its blue tongue out. And there's a little girl that's eating this uh, blue lollipop, and she's sticking her blue tongue out at the dragon. So the obvious emotion here is one where it's like humor, one where it's like, ah, cute again. Um, so did this one do well? Yeah, it did well, even though 
it didn't have like a local trigger like something iconic like the the golden uh gate bridge it didn't have a fan base an existing fan base like the aliens thing but uh, emotion really trumps everything so if it does have mm -hmm. that really solid emotion there that is a pleasing emotion um it'll get to people so there you that go that makes sense i like that a lot it and tells a story pleasing emotion doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be a uh, emotion of anger some people uh -huh. they like that emotion of anger it riles them up it gets them going it's like listening to heavy metal right yes <laughs> yes um and it's not like people necessarily want to get angry but there that is another emotion that can be very viral very vi and of course everybody knows this from uh, all the politics going on in in America these days how polarizing it is stuff like that people get riled up and when they do it can spread very quickly I don't like to do that route I don't like to get people angry you know that's not my thing my thing is more like aw cute so let's go to the next one this one Matt was this one viral hmm that's a good question because this is so cool looking I know I would like it. I would hit the like button if I saw this painting on Instagram or something like that. Yes, but would it make you share it? And that's where it kind of stops. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, maybe I like it, but I don't necessarily need to show all my friends, hey, look at this cool creature painting. When you really think about it, what is the emotional impact of this? It's mm. a little mixed, right? It doesn't really hit anything on the head where you're like, yes, I know exactly how I should feel when I'm watching You know, I, I appreciate it as an artist. That's what it is. There's not that other element to it. I think I see that it's a really cool painting, and I like the lighting and the composition of the background, and, you know, all the artistic factors are there. It now, hits I, on all of those. I wanted to put in this quote-unquote failure because I wanted to show people that even though a piece of art shows some emotion, if it doesn't really hit it on the head, really hit that mm. bullseye, if it only gets it like 70%, there's so much art out there that it can also get very lost very easily. You know, and with this, it's like another trait to s some art being really, really memorable for people is can you describe it to somebody in a way where they will actually go, oh, wow, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm. You know? Um, how would you This would kinda, be hard. Yeah. yeah. How would you kind of explain this one? Have you, have you seen that furry wolf kind of aquatic kind of <laughs> thing? You know, I'm already bored. I already want to move on. <laughs> so let's move on. All right. This one was after seeing uh, a news story about yet another oil <coughs> spill this is mm. back in 2010 i saw this oil spill and i painted this uh this little beautiful little creature that crawls out of the sea uh mm. and lays there on a uh, oil soaked you know s sand and just is ready to die wow right and so does it have emotion there yes it has the mm -hmm. sad emotion right? for sure yeah it's very obvious okay well was it popular no it wasn't popular if it made you angry mm. if i put more anger in there then i'm sure that would be popular but sadness i find is an emotion that you know it can spread but it generally spreads way better when it has fire behind it. It has some anger mm. behind it, which this doesn't. I was just sad. I was just painting this mm. thing, and I was just sad. <laughs> you know? And the thing is, when you think about you read somebody's uh, news you know, on Facebook or whatever it is, it's some sad news. You know, you might get a lot of comments on that one post, of a lot of people saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. And all this, you know, very nice, all these nice words. But 
uh, would they share it? Would you share some sad story from your friend? No, generally not, right? If it was something that really was sad and made you angry, then all of a sudden mm. you would share it, you know, a lot more likely to share it. Because that's ultimately rooted in, you know, hopefully, I mean, this is not always with so much negativity on the internet, but hopefully it's sad and then it, you're a little angry about it, but then you share because you want to do something about it, right? Like there's Perhaps, that element yeah. of contributing. Yeah, like, like you're, you're trying to rile up, you're trying to gather the mob, <laughs> you know, like yeah. Yeah. that's what I want to do when I'm upset. I just want to like, if it's something that I want to voice out on and I'm uh, upset about it, that is the result that I generally would want, right? Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next one here. This one, um, <laughs> World of Warcraft, Blizzard. They asked me to do some illustrations. This was probably my favorite illustration I did for them <laughs> because of the story behind it. And I have to confess, I don't play World of Warcraft. I love the people there, <gasps> but I, I don't know what's going on. And so, uh, but then they gave me this description of an illustration. They said a, one of their uh, goblins that is holding an Easter egg like... Uh, Gollum would hold his ring from Lord of the Rings <laughs> and he's dressed up as an Easter bunny. And I was like, existing fan base, check, right? Mm -hmm. Emotional impact, what is it? It's humor. It's ha ha ha. Yes. So big check. That's a, you know, funny stuff is one of the most viral. That emotion is super viral, right? When you, when you have humor behind it. And the last thing is, is a big trigger. So thinking about the topic and everything, uh, once a year, this painting becomes very relevant. And that's mm. Easter, right? So I was like, okay, yeah, I do want to do this because not only because it's a strong franchise, but because it's a funny idea and there's a huge trigger behind it. I know that come Easter, World of Warcraft and a lot of World, World of Warcraft uh, gamers out there will use this illustration and post about it, and, and it, they totally did. Sure, it's part of that identity thing, like you said about the, the Golden Gate Bridge, right? Exactly, exactly. So it's all about, really, it's all about... Um, creating emotional impact with your artwork uh, technical skills actually only help to support that emotional impact it's not the driving force in other words if you have something that's technically brilliant beautiful and has no emotional impact behind it it will be easily forgettable and people will not remember it Kind of interesting, right? Continue. Yeah, no, that's absolutely. Uh, it's something I think a lot of people neglect while they're working on their technical skills as an artist. Yes. Uh, you want to yes. get the lighting right. You want to get the color because right. Because we're so focused on getting technical skills under our belt. That's the real mm -hmm. struggle that we, we concentrate on. And then all of a sudden that becomes our first thought, which actually mm -hmm. my first thought is how do I want the audience to feel when they look at a piece of art. And that's, that's what everybody should be thinking, really. That's fantastic. I've been exercising a story before creating a piece of art lately. I think that my technical skills, I feel like, are not the best, but I also feel like they're at a point where I could make something if I had the concept down in my head. I could probably, you know, get something out there. But it's, uh, you know, really interesting to try to write a story, a short thing before tackling the image, just to make sure there's that emotional appeal there. Absolutely. You got to have a target. Got to have a target. All right. We got, so now we got some questions over here. Yeah, yeah. Let's do the questions. So now I am switching over back to um, a 
little traditional drawing today. I love these. Awesome. This is raw and unfiltered. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just, <laughs> I'm drawing there. I'm trying to figure things out. So I figured this would be a nice little thing. I gave myself a time limit of an hour to do this uh, little drawing here. So hopefully everybody likes it. Yeah, let's go to the first cool. question. All right. Number one, most popular on the list, of course, is about Lightbox coming up soon. Nice. Um, uh, this user asks, it says anonymous. I'm sorry. If uh, you include your name, I'll be sure to give you a shout out when you ask these questions. Um, the question is, I'll be attending as a visitor and I'd like to be prepared to come across like a professional and make friends with other professional artists there. Do you have any tips? Yeah. Uh, so there's a bunch of tips. One is any event, any function, especially when you're going by yourself, Get there early or get there absolutely on time. Do not be late. Uh, and mm. I'll tell you why this is a good tip. It's because um, I think I might have mentioned this uh, in a previous stream before, but it's it's kind of a good little uh, story. Um, I was invited to a uh, Disney party at Comic-Con. Um, it's going to be all these amazing top you know artists from disney and everything and i think it started at seven so i got there at 6 45 right i get there i'm hanging out outside and and i'm talking to a couple people that are also hang out outside and i ask them hey so is anybody inside and they go no there's nobody at the party right now it's still early there's only like maybe four people and i go to them i'm like oh, okay cool i'll see you guys inside and i i walk in and yeah, there were four people. One bold move. Well, this is why it's actually not a bold move. One <laughs> one person was in human resources. Another person was in, I think, uh, education at uh, Disney. And another person was the the person that invited me. And the last person was um, head of story on Frozen Two. Wow. So right? this is like a perfect group of people. Hey, it could have been, you know, the CEO of Disney, like Bob Iger in the building. There's only four people. I would have been able to talk to him too. <laughs> yeah. You see what I mean? You get there before an event starts, especially when you're all alone, because that gives you the perfect excuse to talk to anybody there before all of their friends arrive. Right, because then after that, then it'll be hard. That's a very good point. Always be on time. That's a good tip. Another tip is uh, for all those people that have maybe a little bit less confidence, a little bit more self-conscious uh, for you guys, make sure that you start it off. You try to set yourself up for success here. Okay, so in other words, talk to the people that you feel um, came with their uh, wife or husband. Like they, they don't want to be there. <laughs> like not, <laughs> not that they're having a bad, bad time, but they are there because of that other person is what I want to say. Those are the people that generally will be much more open to talking with anybody. Hmm. And you know what? There's been actually many times where because I don't, I don't do it on purpose either. I'm just talking. For me, when I go to these things, I literally just flutter around like a butterfly and I just talk to everybody because I just that's how my personality works. But there's been so many times where I'm totally talking to somebody for like 20 minutes. I have no idea who this person is. And then they go... Oh, you, you got to meet my wife. You got to meet my husband. It's like some crazy, amazing, you know, director or whatever, you know, and it's, and they'll bring me over to a circle of people all, you know, listening to that one person talk and, and she or he would just interrupt everybody and go, excuse me, I'm sorry. I need to 
you know, get my husband or wife over here for just a second. You got to meet this person. His name is Bobby, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm having this next awesome conversation with somebody else. And it just started with being genuine and sincere and that's the just tough being part, personable. right? That's the tough part. And that, that's been the easy part for me because I am genuinely interested in pretty much everybody that I, I see, especially at these kind of events, because who knows who you're talking to. So I love talking to these kind of people. That's a really good piece of advice. Be confident, be sincere with people and be on time. Yeah, and don't be, you know, it's like, it's not like confident in a way where you are trying to pretend you know everything, mm. right? I mean, like confident in a way where you can laugh at yourself and you could just be natural. You know, and, and sometimes I've also had it where it's like, uh, maybe in the very beginning, I remember uh, talking to somebody and totally stumbling through everything and hi um my uh yeah so i do um character designs and and then i just stopped you know i was like <laughs> you know what this must be the most embarrassing kind of intro uh, that you have probably ever had and i just made light <laughs> of it right and then he was like no no this one time this other person did this and i was like oh my goodness you know well, one time I did this, you know, and then it just became this little conversation about embarrassing moments. That's wonderful. And asking people about themselves, too, I think is is key. Um, if you don't have anything to say to someone you're standing next to in an elevator and you feel like you just need to say something, you know, ask yeah. them how they're doing. Say something small, you know. I, I feel like focusing – too much on what you feel like you need to say about yourself can get in the way of making a connection sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know what? Uh, one of the reasons why I always ask you to be on these streams is because you are one of those people where it's like you, I could feel like Matt's just being himself, you know, and that's <laughs> something that uh, everybody really appreciates. Oh, yeah. thanks, Bobby. Yeah, that's for awesome. Sure. Yeah. We can ask another question if you want. Yeah, yeah, let's on. do it. Let's do it. Awesome. Uh, speaking of bringing emotion to your artwork, this is the number two question on here. I really like it. How do you bring emotion into an environment? And well, I struggle with this, so I'm excited to hear this answer. Well, for sure. Uh, Toy Story 3 rings a bell. You seen Toy Story 3, Matt? Absolutely. I did a study of a frame the other day. <laughs> Anybody that wonders about this question can just look at every scene in Toy Story 3 involving the daycare. It's a daycare. Kids are running around having fun and being kids. <laughs> you know, it's a happy place. And they show a happy place, but they also show a kind of psych psychotic place where, like, the kids all of a sudden look like psychopaths, <laughs> like, just totally manhandling these uh little helpless toys uh then we see it as a spooky place a mysterious place lighting you know that's how if you can't change anything about the design of the environment you can sure as heck change the lighting okay lighting, yeah lighting creates mood you know yeah like um and maybe what you choose to put in the light versus what you choose not to. It's not just time of day, right? It's whether or not you light your character with an ominous light or whether you bask them in glowing lights or something like that, right? Yeah, one part about um, illustration in general, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, environments or uh, you know character design. It's that uh, we're constantly trying to make excuses to put in things like hmm. a constant like I'll, I'll be painting a character and i i would think yeah you know the back of his head it needs some light well the next question in my head is well what could be the reason that there would be a light there and i try to make up a reason right okay. so um if it's in a forest that's easy you can't see the top of the trees. You're in the forest kind of thing. You could put a light wherever you want. You could put shadows wherever you want. 
because you don't know who knows where the leaves about. are. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. So. And, yeah. Go I'm on. Sorry, I didn't go mean to interrupt. I was gonna say, and what about like, I I I always think about this when I think of these big Craig Mullen style paintings, right? Where there's like a lot going on in that painting, and you see the way those environments break up. And it's just, I, I still feel like I struggle to find that missing ingredient where you, you've got these giant landscapes full of emotion. They're like, I feel emotion when I look at them, you know? Yeah, so, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> I rambled a little. Um, no, I think, what do you say about like lighting a large scale scene, I guess, for emotion? Well, yeah, really, it's it's the same kind of the thing, same. except now you have a much more obvious, most likely a very obvious sense of atmosphere. Mm. You know, unless you're in space, unless you are in maybe like on top of a mountain on a pristine day, it's super crisp air, there's true, not a lot of true. atmosphere. Uh, but generally, yeah, it's pretty much the same thing, except... Uh, you're dealing with atmosphere a lot more. That makes a lot of sense. I might be overcomplicating that where it's sort of the same, even with one character versus a large environment. No, that's um, a good question. It's just more like, how do we simplify the mm, answer? You know? Yeah. I All feel right. like that's I like it. that's the general trend for most artists is like they're always trying to simplify their thinking or their procedures. Yeah, yeah. You're always trying to get down to the core of it. And I feel like when I look back 10 years ago, uh, and if I was going to give myself some art advice, sometimes it would just be like, I don't know, just paint it the right way. <laughs> the advice just comes out like, it's it's hard to overcomplicate it, you know, I get it. Um, yeah. Let's yeah, see. for those of you that joined in late, I'm just going to put up here, uh, oh, send yeah, questions Slido. to slido.com. Hashtag mm -hmm. choose stream one. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. So Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, let's do another one. Um, this person asks, if uh, you are about to make memorable art, is there usually an idea before you start drawing or does it appear during the process? There's generally, um, there, there's generally ideas beforehand. Uh, but most of the time, it hasn't really hit it on the head just yet. I have the general ingredients. Like, I know I'm going to cook pork today, but I don't know all the spices and all the herbs that I'm going to be using just yet. Uh, and really, the pork matters, but also all the little extra little ingredients, all those little touches uh, really complete the overall impression of the meal. Mm, we're still yeah. talking about art here but you know what i mean is right? i'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> so you know i'll i'll start working on the main piece and then there'll be a, a point a lot of times where i'm like ah, yeah it doesn't really hit it on the head just yet okay i need to put little boots on all, on all the little legs of this creature <laughs> there we go that's funny now that's cute now you know stuff like that but you don't have it all figured out in your head. You figure it out as you go on paper, even though you start with a general idea. Yeah, I have the general idea in my head um, and sometimes not. Sometimes, and that's like the worst, when you have zero idea, you you don't have anything that you want to really invest your time in and your effort into to making because you don't have a good idea. So mm. in those cases, I kind of take it like... Um, I, I heard Ed Shearing, the singer, once say, it, it's like it's like his uh, tap water or something. I'm totally going <laughs> to paraphrase or, or butcher or whatever he said. But it's kind of like tap water in, in like uh, maybe one of those places where when you first turn on the tap, there's brown water, right? Mm. And you got to wait. You got to let that tap run until it's clear, and then you could drink it, that water. And the yeah, same it, thing it, with creative ideas. You know, a lot of times you don't have a good idea yet. So I just start drawing, and I just start drawing. 
you know, and then I will draw another thing and another thing and another thing and let all the brown water get out of my head and onto the paper <laughs> until it's clear. And then I'll do some, you know, then I'll start doing the main painting. Yeah, like when I want to do, uh, when I want to work on a painting I'm really serious about, I will sketch for a little while first, just something that's a little low pressure and just draw some heads on a sheet of paper or something. And that first one's always rough, you know, and, and you just keep at it and, you know, you kind of get warmed up that way. I think there's a lot to be said for warming up. Yeah. And for me, the heads thing that I, I don't like to do that as much because, um, well, I like to try to get away from the, that as quick as possible just because mm. then I just have it in my head that I'm just going to keep drawing heads. I'd rather oh. <laughs> keep it in my head where I'm just drawing whatever. It's kind of like clouds in the air and trying to imagine what those clouds can be. That's good advice for me to follow. I need to diversify that a little bit. That's a good tip. Well, I used to do that. I totally know what you're talking about. Yeah. Let's go on. Let's move. ask another one here. Um, the next popular question, I do like the way this works. You guys can vote on which question you like. That's awesome. Um, does the diploma matter? Does the diploma count? Um, in regard to schools, uh, bigger schools or more popular schools, um, as far as employment, uh, or is it what the professors teach? Like, how do you feel about um, how much the diploma matters? I don't even know where my diploma is. <laughs> you know, I... I think I lost it just a few months after I graduated and never <laughs> needed it. Um, but yeah. does it count? It can count, okay? And it can count specifically if you want to uh, move to another country and oh, you, need, wow. you need to apply for a visa and things like that because then the government, you know, they're not going to look at your portfolio. They're going to look at your credentials. They're going to see what kind of things you could check off there and if you have a diploma and stuff so in that case yes it does matter until you have enough experience anyways where it doesn't matter yeah. anymore yeah but early on if you were looking to move that's a good point and that is a very expensive uh you know a very expensive thing if it's just to help you move no. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, if your college costs $200,000 or higher, uh, you want to really think about, is this a good investment? Because that's what it is, right? That's what yeah. all our parents say, education's investment. Well, there's good investments and there's bad investments. So which investment is this? That's what you want to think about. Yeah, is it a is it a good like you don't want to just go get a a degree in business just to be able to move, right? Yeah, and the funny thing is we, this is why um, schoolism has been doing so well because we make it a no brainer, you know. It's like you're paying three hundred dollars for an entire year of education, three hundred dollars, and you're learning from artists that have done, you know, more than most artists have. So you're paying a lot less learning from a lot better uh, instructors generally. Uh, is that a good investment? You know, we really try to make it like a no-brainer. And it's shockingly such a no-brainer that people are like, hey, what's going on here? Why is it so, <laughs> like, affordable? There's no catch. It's just we're trying to do good things. That's awesome. That is definitely a good investment. Um question bobby you have tons of goals and things you want to work on of course how do you decide which ones to tackle first yeah uh well first it's like i love the fact that you put in to decide on something to tackle mm. right because a lot of times especially when we get to that first wave of success there is no deciding we we're we got to that point because we are people that were able to figure out how to say yes to everything. Yeah, I could do that. No problem. I could do that too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You need that extra thing? Okay, yeah, no problem. Right? And that's what brought us to a certain level of success. But then 
at another point, uh, there'll be too many good offers coming in, hopefully, right? And that's when you really need to decide. You need to consciously decide, what am I going to do and what am I not going to do anymore? And that's kind of heartbreaking sometimes because, like, I've had to drop uh, projects that I love and it's just because there's something else that's more important. Um, yeah, for me, it's like, what's going to make the biggest impact towards uh, my ultimate goal? And my ultimate goal is, what can I do to fix the art community, you know, in, in some way or another? How can I make it better? That's my ultimate goal. And a noble one indeed. And we're all glad about it. Um, let's, let's see here. There's another question. Anonymous asks, sometimes you can get stuck doing fan art. How do you make your own original ideas appealing to audiences on the internet without having to draw cats also? I like that. That's funny. <laughs> uh, that goes back to the, the thing that we were talking about in the beginning of the stream, mm -hmm. all about the emotional impact. That's as that's the core of it, right? What is the emotional impact that you're trying to make the audience feel? And, uh, and how dead on did you hit that target? That's true. And you know, that's so much. So I feel like what you went over in the first 20 or 25 minutes of the stream is more important than trying to find your style and trying to paint realistically. And I feel like you can burn a lot of calories on those things and, and even if you become great at them, that last element of being memorable matters so much more. Like you want your art to be shared and seen and appreciated. And oftentimes I don't look at something and say, oh, that's so technically good. Or they have such a strong style. I like all of their art. No, there's certainly something very memorable about it. That That's a very valuable lesson you taught today. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm very. I'm gonna have to rewatch that one and share it with some people. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is there a such thing as being too overtly emotional or divisive? Could you take the emotional side to the extreme? Basically, uh, should you be careful of sending the wrong impression? Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, like um, yeah, people can get really carried away. So I'm not sure what the person is thinking of specifically, mm -hmm. but there is like, there is a goal in my head of the emotion that I want somebody to feel when I'm painting something. So of course, if it's too much, uh, and for me, <laughs> I think about that, uh, there's like this short where where it was, it was Looney Tunes, something or another, <laughs> where somebody gets the love potion, right? And mm. they love uh, Bugs Bunny or they love whoever it was, like, too much. So, of course, there can be too much of something. But um, if it's things like cute, I feel like there's not really a limit of how cute you can go. Uh if it's if it's really hitting the nail on the head you can't do too much cute that's yeah. true anger that one is dangerous that's fire you know yeah. you can't you got to make sure it's under control um, yeah show someone you trust i say yeah always happy a good things, idea do you think happy things really have a limit i don't think no. so no. sad things i think yes like you don't mm -hmm. want to make people feel too sad or too scary i heard there was some uh series or a film on netflix that was so scary that people were fainting and stuff oh man too scary not for me i know <laughs> i'm such a wuss now i used to watch those kind of things but yeah i'm such a wuss now you see you just get you get you develop your creative brain and your imagination so far you can't you can't be doing that well, the thing great is, power comes great responsibility, Bobby. I can't watch scary <laughs> stuff working on children's entertainment. You know, I learned that because it just oh, yeah, seeps wow. into my work. Like some people can, <clears throat> I can't. 
And yeah. So, yeah. So I just stopped watching a lot of scary stuff for the most part. That's a good tip for people, though, is, you know, take a look, take a take a personal inventory of what you bring into your mind, you know, fiction or nonfiction alike. Just what are you surrounding yourself with? Because oftentimes that's what's going to come back out in your work, I feel. On on the same kind of note, something else that's interesting is keep count of how many times your your mind has a negative uh, idea. Hmm. You know, a negative thought. That was very interesting for me too because, like, I've heard about okay, uh, keep track of how many negative things you say, but what about all the stuff that you don't say? And that's in your head, you know, like when somebody cuts you off or something and you're just cursing them to heck, you know, or you, you did a bad drawing and you just look at it and just go, oh man, you idiot. You know, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Keep an eye on how many negative thoughts that you have as well. That's very interesting. Yeah. You can, you can really take a, a good personal inventory that way. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Let's see, another question here. Um, there's a lot of good questions, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I soon will be applying for a dream internship at a studio. As a shy person, I was hoping you might have tips for making a good impression in an interview. Mm. Usually, even shy people have moments or situations where they're not as shy. Right? So... Uh, Think about that slice of your life where you are not shy and you're totally cool with talking with friends or wherever it is. Maybe it's in your parents' old home where you used to, when you used to live with them or um, maybe it's at the local park where you and your friends hang out. Try to take that slice and expand it and think about how you are during that time, how you feel and all that good stuff. Okay, and really try to expand it as much as you can. Um, the second part of it is what is almost everybody kind of looking for in terms of um, these kinds of interviews and stuff like that is honesty. You know, no matter if you're shy, nervous, whatever, am I talking to the real person here or am I talking to a mm. facade? Am I talking to like... Like, they're trying to show me that they're somebody that they're not. If they are, I can't take that. I just, mm. yeah, I just, I really can't stand that. Um, That's so true. I was, uh, my fiance is an art teacher, mm. and her students gravitate to her immediately and want to be friends, and she's so lucky in that way, and she's very grateful for it. And we were talking about it the other day, and it's just because she has authenticity. Like, you see some people come in a little shy with their guard up or something and that makes you nervous too. So like if I see somebody I kind of feel is a little not so authentic, I kind of feel like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And it doesn't make me want to be as open with them. But when you see someone just being open and honest, it really puts everybody at ease. I feel. Yeah. And the other thing is sometimes people might not, you know, gel with that fine that means that you wouldn't have gelled with that person anyways good call right yeah. it's much better to just let whatever hang out you know to an extent obviously you, you don't want to go overboard overboard um <laughs> but you know just be open and honest and see if they gel with you because either way like you you want a good uh experience that's yeah, how you're going to sure. get one. Awesome. Another question. In the Hollywood world, what's more important, creativity and originality or technical skill? The one that's more valued, if you have really good creativity and originality, that does beat technical skills. That's mm -hmm. the highest, you know, like uh, that trumps technical skills for sure. If you look at uh, viral videos. How many of us have seen a like a badly animated uh, little short or whatever that made you laugh and got millions of views? Everybody. True. True. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. 
creativity and you see these things and you're like, oh man, I could have done that. Or, oh, that was so easy. Like if you're thinking about it in terms of skill and uh, it was the creativity and originality that made it, made it work. Let's see another one here. Do we have time for some more? We still do, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, Bobby. Dominic asks, hey, Bobby, how can I take the ideology of making memorable art and apply it to design, specifically a concept art? Um, schoolism is a life changer, by the way. Much love, he says. Nice, Dominic. <laughs> How can I take the ideology of making memorable art and apply it to design, specifically I think, concept art? Well, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think he was asking specifically about concept art, like making memorable concept art, I think, is the, the question. Well, here's the thing. Um, number one, if you're designing a character to feel a certain way, like, if you know when people look at this character, they're going to want to see a cute old green man uh, that later brings out some lightsaber or whatever, <laughs> uh, then you you already have an emotional uh, objective, right? And you would bring in all your technical skills, all of your skills of design and everything pointed towards that emotion. The other thing about it is that a lot of directors, they respond way better, way, way, way better to, uh, to something emotional. So a lot of times when I read a script, I'll highlight the, the parts of the script where I think, yeah, that scene would be great. You know, it would really show the character and everything. Uh, and then I'll paint that scene. And if that scene hits that emotional beat that the director wants, it's not far from getting that design in the right direction. That's a good point. Hitting on that emotion with the director makes them respond to your artwork in that way where you probably not only captured what they were going for, but maybe brought something to it that they didn't expect. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, imagine you're designing Kung Fu Panda and you hand in these designs that are just like these crosses, right? Like <laughs> yeah. uh, just stale poses. It would probably never get approved. I wouldn't see how that would ever get approved. I mean, there's no connection with it. Yeah. Here's another question. What kind of jobs are available for artists that draw more than paint? Um, Anonymous asked the... Yeah, I feel like my ideas are done more in sketch form. Um, there's less jobs generally. You know, everybody is learning not just how to sketch, but how to paint. But on that same note, if you get to... Here's how to make it simple. How much demand is there for what you're doing um, and how many people out there can do what you do? If there's mm -hmm. a million people that can do what you can do, then you're not going to do well, right? If, or if there's millions of people that can do what you can do, you're not going to do that well. If you are only drawing, but you're drawing at such a skill that there's only a tiny handful of people that like maybe two or three people that can do what you do at that level, i.e. like Ian McKegg. He mm. worked on uh, the Marvel movies, yet when you look at his paintings, his drawings, his concepts, they look much sketchier than, say, uh, like Ryan Minardine's uh, incredible renderings, like full-on renderings, right? Yet... Ryan would still want Ian to work on some stuff because there's so few people that can draw like Ian. And you could get away yeah. with a lot more. Claire Wendling, same kind of thing. Like her drawings are, there's like, there's like nobody that can draw like Ian or Claire. And so, of course, uh, that's okay for them. When you join that 
upper echelon of where like their style is so connected to the medium right yeah so it's not about sketching or being able to paint and things like that it's more about how much demand is there for that and how many people are at your level or higher all right um i've got another popular question about lightbox here um will there be portfolio reviews at lightbox Port Arbonia asks lightbox lightbox expo it's all about uh how to appreciate the artists how to give back to the art community and that includes portfolio reviews and that also includes free portfolio reviews because you know you shouldn't have to pay to get your portfolio reviewed in my opinion it's been happening for decades already you know artists uh giving critiques to another artist we shouldn't yeah you know my rant there will be free <laughs> portfolio reviews for sure well, that's good that's good that's something that i think is really going to make things stand out um another question here that is popular what do you think would gain more publicity a boring drawing that is very technically has very good technical skill or a crappy drawing that is memorable a crappy drawing that's memorable actually Mm -hmm. uh, a beautifully technical uh, drawing can be more memorable when it gets to a certain level of skill. So that because you got to a certain level of skill, all of a sudden there is an emotional impact. There's this awe-inspiring, like, how did you do that kind mm, of feeling. Yeah, even if, sure. even if it's the most boring subject. I can see that. Yeah. And then like you think in the other end of like uh, some funny cartoons, some funny illustrators in the past that, you know, they kind of build their style around the the rough edges of their artwork. And it's not so much about the technical skill as it is getting across a really funny idea. And that's that's something you can take away from that. Absolutely. That's a great point. Let's see. Joel Santana asks. Technology is changing and advancing so much these days. Do you ever worry that our jobs as artists could be in danger or lose any value? The robots are coming, Bobby. <laughs> I wonder. I really wonder. You know, because it's like we are already creating AI just from, you know, Siri is AI. You mm -hmm. know, you got like massive amounts of data getting fed to. I don't know where Siri is, but she's learning. When, when I say into my phone now. She's growing. Yeah, when I say, like, when I dictate something, like writing out an email, I'll dictate it a lot of times, and I'll say, whatever, whatever, schoolism. And now Siri knows schoolism, and we'll spell it out. Wow. Right? Like, we are dealing with this anyways. It'll be interesting to see where it all goes. You know, what happens when... Uh, AI has better creativity than us. Oh Man. my goodness, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that'll make your stomach turn a little bit if that's ever a thing. If, if one day a movie comes out and it just says no one worked on this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. Oof. But I think there's also always more new and interesting places to get jobs. Like when you know. People talk about the internet taking over old brick and mortar jobs. I think of all of the new interesting jobs that get created for oh, people yeah. with those talents. You know what? I, I always thought about like, um, you know what would be a great idea for a college uh, where you have a college where you can actually uh, learn how to make cosplay or oh, you whoa. know, like all the new stuff. Like whoa, how yeah. do you become a professional video gamer? Right? How do you right. become a professional cosplayer? How if do you... Adam Savage, if Adam Savage from Tested and Mythbusters oh. made a school, I'd, I'd drop everything. Yeah, his his <laughs> costumes are so phenomenal, phenomenal. Ugh. Love it. Yeah. So there you go, everybody. That's the end of our stream. An hour awesome. went by like this. That so flew by. Totally. Thank you to everybody that participated in the stream, asked the questions. Slido yeah. did really well. It's a really good 
program for these questions. So thank you guys yeah. for participating in that. And uh, thank you to my wonderful co-host, Matt. Thank you, yeah. Matt Johnson. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you guys for all the great questions. That was a lot of fun. Right on. Till next time. Take care, everybody. Bye.